amazing speakers that I want to get started. Uh, welcome everyone again. If you've just joined us, uh, I'm Kristen Daly. I'm the Executive Director of Global Washington and uh, the host for today. Please type in your name and affiliation in the chat when you, uh, when you join. And uh, I want to tell you all we're recording this uh, for Global Washington and for the speaker's own, own use. So um, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have such a great group of speakers here and the participants. I'm, uh, the participants, all of you that are signing up, most of you are practitioners in this field or in global development. So uh, the format for today is that I'll be asking the panelists a few questions so they can set the set the context for our topic today. And then we'll, we'll keep plenty of time for Q&A from all of you. And the way we're gonna do the Q&A is that there's a, a button on the bottom of your screen, usually it's on the bottom, um, that says Q&A. And I want you to type in your questions there and please try to direct it at one of the panelists specifically. And then I will verbally ask those questions of the panelists and they'll verbally answer to everyone. But please hold your questions because they might answer your questions during the presentation. So hold your questions until about 1045 and then uh, we'll open it up shortly after that. So the talk of, topic of our conversation today is uh, focused on children who are the most vulnerable population right now in low and middle income countries. As many of you know, the impacts of COVID, of course there's a health impact, but in some countries, the economic impact is even greater. And this is causing a lot of families to make desperate choices with the drastic, uh, drastic lockdowns in some of these countries. Parents are having to choose to send their children out into the workforce uh, out of desperation to make some money. And families have been told that their children are less susceptible to getting COVID or that they will uh, have better health outcomes and that's why they're sending their children out. And the issue of child labor even before COVID is very complex and the solutions need to have a, a multitude of interventions in order to be successful, including economic and educational and legal, just to name a few. So today I'm really honored to have true experts in this topic and the organizations that are represented here today are true leaders in protecting vulnerable children. So let me introduce the, the uh, speakers and we'll get right into the conversation. First, we have Anne Goodard, who's the CEO of Child Fund International and started her career as a social worker in Massachusetts and then went on to get her master's in public health after spending some time in the Peace Corps in Kenya. She worked for CARE for nearly 20 years and was in Somalia, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Egypt. She's been at Child Fund for the past 30, 13 years, and she's been active uh, with Interaction and the US Global Leadership Coalition. And those are two organizations that also work with Global Washington. So Child Fund's mission is to help deprived, excluded, and vulnerable children living in poverty so they can have the capacity to become young adults, parents, and leaders who will then bring lasting and positive change to their communities. And Child Fund also, it delivers its program through 250 local implementing partners and operates in 24 countries with a special emphasis on protecting uh, children across, across the globe through its approach. Next, we have Zama Neff, who's the Executive Director of Children's Rights Division at the Human Rights Watch. Zama has been at Human Rights Watch for nearly 20 years, specializing in access to education, police violence, refugee protection, and some of the worst forms of child labor. She also co-chairs the Global Coalition to Protect Children from Attack. And she is an accomplished author and often appears in media as an expert on children's rights. Before Human Rights Watch, Zama clerked for the, a US federal judge, advocated on behalf of immigrants and refugees in the US, and worked with community development and women's organizations in Honduras. Human Rights Watch, their mission and what they do is investigate, they investigate and report on abuses happening all over the world. They are 450 people of 70 plus nationalities who are country experts, lawyers, journalists, and others who work to protect those most at risk. They investigate, expose, and work 
work for change to change the injustices. Um, then we have, sorry, now we have Lisa Zook, who's the quality assurance manager at Amplio. And Lisa is actually a self-described data geek who enjoys improving programs through data visualization and communication. She leads Amplio's monitoring and evaluation and contributes to the research and evaluation teams. She is also a co-founder of the Seattle Evaluation Association. In addition to being data-driven, Lisa is also a strong proponent of community-led development and amplifying community voices in program decision-making. In her current role, she's worked with Save the Children, RTI, World Vision, UNICEF, the World Bank, Bank and Right to Play. Amplio's mission is to empower vulnerable communities through knowledge sharing. They do this through their uh, talking book technology that enables governments and organizations to overcome barriers such as low literacy, lack of electricity and internet, and gender bias for access. So thank you all for joining us today. So just to start off the conversation and to set the context, I'd like each of you to tell us a little bit more about the initial impacts of the pandemics in the regions where you work. What was the government action in the early days, earlier this year in those countries? And what was the civil society, what, how did the civil society react in the early days? Um, Anne, I'd like to start with you. Thank you, Kristen. As we all know, uh, the pandemic rolled out around the world at its own pace and hit countries um, at different times and in different ways. And there was a wide variety of responses from countries in terms of uh, limiting, uh, limiting uh, people staying at home, uh, closing businesses, putting curfews on, etc. It really was a broad spectrum. And I think all of us in the early days, uh, and I, when I talk about civil society, I talk about um, the development of humanitarian community, because that's the part of civil society I belong to. Our early days, I think our collective community was trying to figure out exactly what was going on with government, what um, space that we had to continue to act, because that was very important to us. So I would say that the conversations really dominated on three issues early, in the early days. Again, um, how to keep our staff safe themselves, we're a global organization like others, and we had staff all over the world, so we really had to take care of our staff first, make sure they weren't um, uh, caught behind borders that were closing down or um, their passports wouldn't allow them to move, things like that. And how do we could continue operating? Um, so second, I think, again, all the humanitarian and development community, um, we were figuring out what our response was to this, both the uh, medical emergency pandemic, but as you said, the economic impact this was having. And it was our responsibility to figure out how to act. Even when everybody else was closing down, we were focused on how to act, how to bring services and support to the communities we worked in. And third was really a very pragmatic thing, um, was our outreach to donors. We can only do the work with the donors, we, um, with the support of donors. And we were all pivoting rapidly and we had to be going back and checking with our donors um, in some ways to get permission to pivot. So um, Child Fund particularly, um, to help us figure out our response in our countries, in the, the local civil society communities that we work in, we did a rapid uh, child protection assessment. We were able to do that in about 12 countries to really figure out how were the, uh, uh, the uh, rules and regulations of government, how was that impacting on families and communities? What risk was that raising for children? And based on this and other country reports, we, like all other organizations, developed our COVID-19 response plan. And Child Fund is a member of a federation of organizations around the world, 11 members in other countries. And it was the first time ever, actually, that we got together as 11 members and said, this issue is so big, we have to respond together. So we came up with our um, kind of our, our plan. First was really in the early days was to educate people about what COVID-19 was about and how they could protect themselves. As you know, there was a lot of misinformation going around or inadequate information because it was brand new to so many people. It caught us all by surprise. Second, we already saw that um, the, um, there was the health impact, but then the economic impact, as you mentioned, was probably, and it turned out to be, much greater in the communities we worked in. Most of the families we work with 
um, their fam parents are day laborers. They earn the money that they use to buy food every day. And with the restrictions in place for mobility or, or, or uh, businesses um, being cut down or being forced to close, we knew that was gonna uh, cause a lot of financial hardship in families. And that was from our perspective, looking at kids that was gonna raise two big issues. One on the stress um, in families that can increase violence. And two was on hunger. We were really afraid about kids being hungry because as I said, a lot of people, they don't have their pantries full as we ended up doing here in the US and emptying out our grocery stores. They need to buy their food every day because they earn it. Third, uh, uh, so we were concerned about hunger. We were just concerned about how to keep children safe. And we'll get into that more about uh, increases in child labor and uh, online sexual exploitation. And fourth, um, how to keep children learning. Uh, because schools were being closed down and, and one size did not fit all with all the different um, possibilities and all the different kinds of restrictions around the world. And that definitely is also related to child labor as we will explore how, um, you know, uh, keeping kids in school is one of the big deterrents to keeping kid, kids out of child labor. So it was a, it, it is, continues to be a worldwide effort for us. And our, with our goal of, with our plan that we put together, our goal of reaching over 6 million children and family members by the end of the calendar year. And we, like everybody else, is still deep in that response. Thank you, Anne. Um, it's, it's good to know that you pivoted really quickly and responded. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, Zama, can you talk a little bit about uh, your work in the early days of the pandemic and um, where you work in those countries? Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, I'll, I'll focus on the human rights implications because as the pandemic was hitting, governments were taking action or failing to take action that had immediate human rights implications for children. Um, so Human Rights Watch um, immediately started both documenting governments using the pandemic to violate human rights of children, calling out those violations and trying to stop the worst effects of what governments were doing or, or failing to do. And that's really sort of the, the pillars of our work. And uh, we use sort of three words to describe what we do, investigate, expose, and change. So if you can imagine you know, over 150 researchers locked down in 50 countries around the world, you can imagine people doing an immediate pivot to remote research and trying to find out exactly what's, what was happening um, uh, for, for human rights. And, and what we found were um, decisions that were made, sometimes out of misperceptions about how children were affected by the pandemic that were extremely harmful. So for example, extreme lockdowns on children's movement. For example, in the Philippines, we documented children even being put in dog cages or coffins for um, violating curfews, a mother being fined for, for letting her children play outside. We looked at detention where there was um, publicity about um, people being released from detention for COVID related reasons, trying to prevent the spread. And we found that for the most part, children were being left out of those releases, even though around the world, about three quarters of children who are detained have not ever been convicted of any crime. They're detained pretrial, and we believe that they could be safely released. Worse, kids were being, in some cases, um, confined to their cells for 23, 24 hours a day, essentially in solitary confinement, which is considered a form of torture and denied family visits um, that were so important to them. So trying to draw attention to even children being left out of those measures. But we also tried to look at what human rights issues were being overlooked in the crisis, whether it was, for example, children um, being summarily deported from the US or forced to remain in Mexico or denied the right to apply for asylum under the US remain in Mexico program. And through the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack, which is a, a coalition of um, nine agencies working together to protect education and armed conflict, we went ahead and put out um, our survey of attacks on education, attacks on school teachers and students around the world, um, not only looking at that as an element of armed conflict, but looking, for example, at how in the context of COVID, militaries um, were able to take advantage of vacant school buildings to move in and, and use them for military purposes. Finally, we use that information um, for a reason, and that's to try to stop human rights violations against children. 
So we found that um, where it was put in the context of COVID, we could, COVID, we could get um, uh, still a great deal of media attention to human rights abuses against children, but also that our, that our key advocacy targets um, became quite available and, and even more so than ever available online. They, they themselves were not going anywhere. So you could um, talk with diplomats in Burkina Faso's capital in the morning, the UK foreign office at noon, and an ambassador um, to the UN in New York City in, in the afternoon, um, that that advocacy in some ways has, has become much more accessible. And um, we found that some of this work, even in the early days, was successful. So to give you two examples, in um, Bosnia, we found a total ban on children and people over the age of 65 leaving their homes and even being fined when they did so. And working with others, we, we put out that information. And fairly soon after, a constitutional court in Bosnia said that uh, a total ban on outdoor movement for children and older people violated their right to freedom of movement and declared that that was disproportionate. Similarly, in Greece, in April, we launched a Free the Kids campaign in order to get the Greek government to free hundreds of unaccompanied migrant children who were being held in deeply unhygienic police cells and detention centers where they faced an increased risk of coronavirus. And a week after, a couple of weeks after Free the Kids was launched, um, the government promised to end these kinds of detentions. So in short, in the early days of the pandemic, it was very important to keep human rights up front and ensure that, that governments were protecting children, but that they were in the process of attempting to do so were not sacrificing their long-term human rights. Thank you for that. I feel that so many people in the early time of the pandemic became um, very focused on their own safety. And it, I think the, the information wasn't coming out in terms of public awareness about these human rights abuses. So it's so vital that Human Rights Watch is doing this work and getting the information and getting the data together and doing the advocacy. It's interesting. You can do that a little more effectively. So um, thank you for telling about that, telling us about all of that right now. Lisa, can you talk about um, maybe more specifically in Ghana about how um, what happened with the government response and civil society there in the early days? Sure. Thanks, Kristen. So yeah, Amplia works at a slightly different um, level. So we're providing the talking book product and services for social behavior change communication through our partners and our implementing organizations. And so as I think it's been mentioned in the other two, two discussions, you know, we had different stages that every, every country, every project was at. And so we had projects that, that ended prematurely. Um, we had projects that were just getting off the ground and and like for instance in Nepal the the government pulled um, a lot of nonprofit workers to work on response throughout the sectors and so that took a lot of the the staff and the resources away from projects that we had been anticipating would, would get moving um, to COVID response and so so we had that happening and then we have a country office in Ghana and and they had just wrapped up a UNICEF project um, on C4D and I think that closed out in about in January and so so they actually saw this as an opportunity. Um, so the, the Ghanaian government, I think they had their first case in, in mid-March. I think by the end of March, they were in partial lockdown and um, they had started to close their borders. And our country office there is located up near the Burkina Faso border. And so they actually, um, Took, took this opportunity to say, you know, as I think has been mentioned already, the information is, is really, really vital at this time. And so, so they, they repurposed the talking books that had been used in that previous UNICEF project that had just closed. They worked with Ghana Health Services to, to develop um, messages that that on, on COVID um, prevention and where to seek treatment and the potential for lockdown because at that time there hadn't been an official kind of mandate on lockdown but they tried to to help the communities um, prepare for the measures that, that were coming and with the talking book they were able to do that in local language so so at the time i think as all these governments were trying to sort out exactly what's going on and what their messaging is you know especially in ghana those efforts really focused on the the capital cities and the big cities and so these rural communities where we had been working the local language was was really key and so 
So the Amplio team in Ghana got those messages off um, and, and actually is still working on that project today to, to address kind of the, the ripple effects of COVID um, and, and how these communities are still handling things. Great, thank you, Lisa. It's good to have a, a specific country perspective um, also. Um, so Zama, I wanna go back to you. We've been talking about the impact of COVID on children, but can you actually give us a better idea? Um, tell us the landscape of, of the issues that vulnerable children are dealing with. What are the greatest threats to children worldwide right now that are probably exacerbated by COVID? But can you give us that context first? Sure, and you know, sort of relating back to our overall theme of child labor, um, I think the two biggest threats are for children, the shutting down of schools, the, the massive disruption to education, and then the human rights consequences of the economic crisis. So I'll talk about each, each one of those. I mean, first, when it comes to education, I think this is probably something many people on this call can personally identify with. We are seeing the most massive disruption to education in anyone sort of living living memory. Um, overall, something like 1.5 billion children have had disruptions to their education. And many children have been left entirely without um, schooling. Countries that have switched to distance learning have found that kids are being left out because they don't have access to the internet. I mean, even in the United States, about 12 million children didn't have good access to the internet before the pandemic. Now, that is the main vehicle in many places for the delivery of, of education, much less having internet connected devices or in, in um, places where at least people are using smartphones, have enough data on their devices um, to fully participate. Um, there are some interesting good low tech solutions, but we've been talking with children and families around the world. We've done about 400 interviews with um, children and families and teachers around the world and had, for example, a girl in Garissa and again, Kenya, sort of up closer to the Somali border, talk about how there were radio classes available for um, students there, but, but she didn't have um, a radio. So low tech was good, but still big gaps for, for kids. Um, children with disabilities are often totally left out. Um, we talked to the mother of a blind student in Lebanon who said distance learning is great, but it, it hasn't been made accessible for my um, child who's blind. Um, separate from that has been the collection of children's data and, and uh, the embrace of distance learning for obvious reasons has also let companies collect massive amounts of children's private education info information, which is often far less protected than than children's health data, though it can be equally as sensitive. And I think going forward, we're gonna see countries that don't have strong data protection laws for children really struggle to hold companies accountable for what they're gonna do with all of this data they have scooped up on, on children. But finally, when it comes to distance learning, I think it is remarkable that, um, that you know, for, for, pe for people, even people who worked in the education of field, the field of education and emergencies. Distance learning was something for, for kids in really remote or disaster struck areas. Now we have um, millions of parents, millions of parents who may also work for donor governments who can understand um, the critical importance of, of distance, distance learning. Um, in addition to, addition to the issues around distance learning, um, we saw just what happened to vacant school buildings and how vulnerable they, they can be. I mentioned that earlier with the Global Coalition. Um, we saw, for example, in South Sudan, a school that was closed down for COVID, um, that Sudanese forces came in, they dug a trench around the school, they moved in to use the school for training, and then when the community wanted to reopen the school, which was a girls' school, um, for secondary school exams, the troops didn't want to leave, and they told the girls they had to go elsewhere. So, you know, sort of long-term consequences of school buildings being taken over and then not being available when, um, when the pandemic eases. But it's not just the lost education from um, the closure of schools, it's also the protective function of schools. So we documented kids who even in the first two weeks of school closures in the UK um, were going hungry because the government hadn't figured out how to provide them with food. And then the human rights violations that flow from, from not being in school, including um, early um, enforced marriage, especially for girls, but also labor exploitation. And so that's connected with the second biggest threat, which is the lack of um, the, the human rights violations that flow from the from the economic crisis. And UNICEF and Save the Children are forecasting that um, something like 672 million children could be living in poverty by the end of 2020. That's 
an increase of 15% in one year. And in order to sort of give some context to that percentage, according to the ILO, the International Labor Organization, just a 1% rise in poverty leads to a 0.7% rise in, in child labor. So you could imagine what a 15% rise in poverty may mean. Already we're seeing studies coming out um, that have found an increase in child labor in artisanal uh, mines in the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Cong Congo. Um, and our researchers speaking with folks in CAR have said that people are directly attributing um, some of that child labor to school closures. But children are also likely to accept work for less pay um, and be willing to work in more vulnerable conditions, as I uh, heard from working children in gold mines in Tanzania, and may uh, be recruited deliberately by businesses who want to cut their costs by recruiting children, um, paying them less, um, especially if families are vulnerable enough to have to seek exorbitant credit or even put their kids in debt bondage, as I've seen in the past in the silk industry in India. Um, finally, kids may, um, it, it may work the reverse, not just, not just that kids are ending up in exploitative labor because their schools are closed, but also where schools are reopening. We're finding um, teachers reporting, for example, um, on the U.S. Um, border, um, on, the, on the Texas side, reporting that some of their kids can't um, attend distance learning because they have to work or they're caring for children at home, younger brothers and sisters, so their parents can work. But this has even come up. Um, in New Zealand, and you think if there are kids who can't go to school in New Zealand because they have to work, um, it's a real indicator of, of the global nature of the, of the crisis. Um, this threatens a two-decade decline in um, the reduction of the worst forms of child labor. Remember, there were 152 million children already involved in child labor before the pandemic, and even those gains are, um, are a threat. So between lost education and the human rights implications of the economic crisis, um, child labor should be right at the front of our agenda, um, dealing with that as the emergency that it is. Thank you for spotlighting that. It, it, it's, it's tragic that y you do see some of these things during um, crises, during uh, conflicts and war, even natural disasters and earthquakes, but this has been such a prolonged time that it's becoming um, even worse and, and definitely having the child labor aspects of it because it's a prolonged crisis. So um, thank you for setting that context for us. Um, Anne, uh, you mentioned this earlier and we know that um, some of the worst forms of child abuse is online sexual exploitation. So can you talk about if you've seen a rise in that <clears throat> during this pandemic and, and what Child Fund is doing in that space? Oh, and I think you're on mute. Uh, thanks, Kristen. You're right. Um, uh, online sexual exploitation is, we think, one of the worst forms, egregious forms of, of child labor. And, um, and it's often driven by economic issues and it's very transactional in nature. So uh, we know that we have a huge economic issue, a huge economic crisis for many families around the world. So we are, uh, are concerned and we've seen some evidence that it is increasing. Um, it, online sexual exploitation can also be a gateway to other forms of child labor like prostitution or trafficking to engage in domestic work as well. Um, even before the onset of COVID, um, OSEC has been increasing around the world. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received from 1998 to 2017, so just less than 20 years, they received more than 23 million reports of child sexual abuse materials being circulated worldwide. Half of that was in 2017. So now we go to 2019, the latest data that they have. Uh, they received almost 17 million reports of child sexual abuse materials, featuring almost uh, a little over 69 million videos, images, and files. So now we're really concerned that this is increasing. Why? We have, as we've talked about already, schools being closed, um, many families restricted to their home, children having more um, contact on the internet for education purposes, entertainment, socialization. Many parents and caregivers are trying to juggle working at home or trying to find um, income for their family and taking care of their kids. So there's less um, supervision, adult supervision going on online. Um, offenders themselves, now there's been some research to show, are more likely to offend 
for two reasons. One, the stress that this pandemic is causing everyone. And two, isolation. Isolation gives opportunity. People are home alone. And additional research has shown that many victims own caregivers um, motivated because of the financial crisis that they're in have, are involved in this themselves. 96% um, of online streamed abuse, 96% investigated by the Internet Watch Foundation shows a child on their own in their home and often involves parents support in some way. So we have more people at home, more people under crisis, less children being uh, supervised. So even before the pandemic, Child Fund was working on the issue of child labor. We had a major, this was one of the, we had a major project um, in the Philippines, building capacity awareness, advocacy and programs in order to address child labor in Mindanao. And this is one of the programs I mentioned earlier that we were able to approach the donor, which is the Department of Labor, the US Department of Labor, and negotiate for a pivot of this program. So we got permission very early on. So we started our, as our response, as I laid out earlier, helping people educate them about the disease, protect, giving protective equipment, et cetera, but also importantly, providing cash to families. We saw this as a very important part of our programming for two reasons. One, to deal with um, child hunger and because of the economic crisis, and two, to reduce crisis um, in families, pressure in families, right? So that would, um, if families had cash, they would be more likely as well to engage in online sexual exploitation and other labor because their needs were being met. So within a short time, within these six months, we've um, distributed almost $4 million now, reaching 120,000 households in all the countries we work in. And it's meeting basic needs, reducing stress, giving families another choice, what they can do um, to meet the financial needs of their family. Um, in the Philippines as well, we had an online um, uh, social media campaign, hashtag shutdown OSEC campaign, and that resulted in congressional members of the Philippines submitting OSEC refocused um, legislation uh, to the government. Tech companies reached out to us and wanted to partner with us on this. They were obviously aware of this issue. And one of the goals of the project was to increase public awareness, and we've had almost a doubling of media pickup of these kind of stories. So particularly during the pandemic, Facebook and Globe, uh, this is again in the Philippines, Globe, Telecom, the Philippines reached out to us. And together we developed and uh, delivered internet safety materials and activities to children, youth, and families via text blasts, social media posts, and radio programming. And sometimes we give radios to families as well because we recognize that is a problem, as Zama, Zama mentioned, that radio programs happening, but kids need radios to be able to use them. We have a similar campaign in Ecuador in English is called now you know hashtag let's navigate safely as well to educate people about what's happening and how they can um, help their children and parents and caregivers protect their kids online. In Mexico, we're doing something different. We're partnering with the Mexican government Center for Economic Crimes Against Minors. It's to help them nationally scale up their newly developed prototype aimed at detecting and removing sexually explicit, explicit um, material about children online. And a different kind of project altogether in the, Indonesia, uh, we have integrated OSEC uh, awareness materials into our positive parenting programs, which targets children seven to 14. So all different approaches with the same goal of reducing the vulnerability of children um, to OSEC as a, a very exploitive means of, of uh, child labor. And we say, I said earlier that parents are sometimes involved in this and support this as a means because they're under a lot of crisis themselves and they're trying to raise um, money to support their families. Um, but, and when I was in the Philippines before the pandemic, the staff there told me a lot of parents don't realize that this is um, harmful to their children. They think there's no one in the room, no one is touching the child, this is not harmful to them. But we know that's not true. And I want to end my comments now with a quote from a, a, a teenage girl that we've been working with in the Philippines. Um, she, at the age of 12, um, she was um, um, through the, her neighbors coerced her into getting involved in sexual exploitation by streamlining, streaming videos online. And this is her comments on it. I didn't understand what was happening. Her name is Magnetic. Um, what they were doing was not good and not right. I was scared that someone would tell the police and I would be put in jail. 
it really pained my heart. I kept asking myself, why did this happen to me? I worry that most houses, even the small ones, have internet. Some small children have these things hidden in their cell phones. So I'll end with that. Thank you, Anne. Such a tragic situation. And I'm, I, I'm really glad you talked about the solutions that Child Fund is doing for this and the interventions. It's so needed. Um, thank you. Uh, Lisa, as Anne was talking about all the interventions and the success that they're having, um, it made me think about, I'm sure Child Fund is doing this, but I'd like to hear how Amplio involves the community in giving input into program design, especially in these interventions, like everyone is saying, you have to pivot and do things differently now with the pandemic. And I said this earlier, and, and you have it in your bio, that you're just a strong proponent about really getting good quality community input for program design and actual decision making by the community. So can you talk a little bit more about that and uh, what Amplio is doing in that space? Sure, thanks. So, so just as some background uh, for people who might not be as familiar with Amplio, um, we've been referencing this talking book uh, this is actually the talking book. So it's a, it's a device like this that messages are recorded and, and played out. Um, but, and, and I, we should say on demand as well. So people can, can access this at any time and it's battery operated. So um, we've tried to bridge the gap of illiteracy and electricity and some of these issues that, that we're all well aware of with with like radio and TV programming, kind of only reaching the people that have access to those materials. Um, but this, this idea of community feedback and, and interaction is so fundamental to what we do that, that there's a functionality in the talking book that, that people can record their user feedback is what we call it, but they can record a message and kind of their response to a message that they're hearing on the talking book. Um, and, and that's been such a vital part of what Amplio does is, is gathering that feedback, um, analyzing it and feeding it back into the program. So, so for example, often our partners or organizations will put out a message like wash your hands, um, the importance of washing your hands and, and the messages we'll get back, we'll say, you know, but we don't have soap. And it, it might seem quite simple, but having that, that direct feedback from the community is, is quite strong. And so, you know, similarly, we had an issue or, or a topic come up where, where an organization was, was um, trying to prevent child marriage and, and through the user feedback mechanism it became apparent that, that the messages on just, you know, child marriage isn't right weren't really effective because the communities were struggling with, with the fact that the children were getting pregnant. And, and so then they, they would get married, but, but the root cause obviously was, was the pregnancy. And so, so they, the, the program changed their messaging to kind of meet those root causes. Um, for the COVID response, it, it's interesting because we decided, because we needed to change things so rapidly and kind of get messages out so quickly, we decided to, to set aside the user feedback mechanism um, on the talking book. And, and that was for a few reasons. One, it's we gather so much qualitative data and it takes a long time to, to process that information and, and get real insights. And that's something that you know, we're constantly talking about. How can, we, how can we streamline this process and make it more effective? Um, but on top of that, the the talking books in this particular model were sitting with the community health nurses and volunteers so so the volunteers would actually take the talking book to households use it to kind of um facilitate conversation with the households and and then move on to the next household they were also sitting at the the community health centers for for interaction there and and so it just, it didn't lend itself to a user feedback model really well um, so we, we wanted to strategize, okay, but, but we still need to be gathering this feedback from the community. How do we do this? Because our go-to mechanism pre-COVID isn't really going to work in this situation. So, so the Ghana team hired um, what, what we called m and &E assistants that sat in each of the eight districts where the program was, was taking place. And their job was to check in with community members and, and also the nurses and volunteers. Um, and I think that's something that, 
that was often overlooked in a lot of in a lot of our discussions, which was, you know, we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the communities, but but also these nurses and volunteers that are quite scared going into households, having to do interactions with people when they're being told social distancing is the only way to prevent themselves from, from contracting the disease and things. So those ME assistants were our kind of um, boots on the ground, you know, tell us what's going on in these communities. And then, and then we also did a household survey. And so once things, I think it was maybe three months into, into the project, we felt like, you know, we've gotten two deployments of messages out. Um, let's do a, a socially distanced household survey and get some feedback on what the community members are actually struggling with and, and what they're challenged with now that the, the initial kind of COVID response has taken place, but there's these ripple effects, these ramifications on things like child labor, education, income, all of those issues. And so through that survey, we identified kind of a number of, of um, issues that were arising in these communities and each one looked slightly different. So, so two districts, we're really struggling with stigma um, associated with COVID. So we ask questions around, you know, do you feel comfortable with someone that, that has recovered from coronavirus coming back into the community? And, and two districts in particular were, were, were really against the idea of reintroducing those, those people who have recovered from the disease. So, so the team used, um, used that to prompt messages on, on recovery and how to combat stigmatization. And then others were struggling with things like domestic violence and child labor and what do we do with our kids that are now out of school. And so in those districts, the programming really, really took that, that focus. Um, and so, yeah, we had to think on our feet on how are we still going to keep this, this component that's so vital to our programming. You know, social behavior change communication is only effective if we're actually addressing the, the barriers that communities face, right? And to, to do that, we need to understand what those barriers are. And all of our, our like typical way of collecting that information was thrown out the window with the pandemic. And so, so the team, um, the team kind of acted on their feet and, and we have lots of lessons learned from that. But I think, I think we were still able to gather a lot of feedback from the community to, to, to feed into the messaging moving forward. That's great. Yeah, I think across the board in global development, people are realizing that the model of people living in the United States flying to other countries that are low and middle income countries and being the primary person is, is not, it can't work right now. And it actually is a way that maybe we can all think about new models and really having like all of you are doing, working with local partners, empowering, building capacity, having um, people there that are part of the communities building it up. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so I have one more question for each of the panelists and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So again, think of your questions and type it in the Q&A tab that's on the bottom of your screen, not the chat. Type it in there and then I'll verbally ask the questions of the panelists and they will verbally answer them. And also it's a good place if you put it in the Q&A and we run out of time, we can collect all those questions and hopefully get back to you with um, good answers as well. So uh, my last question really um, is to talk about the future. We started with earlier in the pandemic uh, talking about a, a few specific issues within that. And now I wanna ask each of you about the future and where, what you think is going to happen specifically with child labor. And if you're optimistic, this is um, a hard time, I think, to be optimistic. Um, and you don't have to say that you are if you're not, <laughs> but if you, it sounds like also each of your organizations has actually done amazing work and made progress to, to get back at least a little bit of what, where we were at before with child labor. So um, I, I'd love for each of you to, to talk about the future from your perspective. Um, Zama, let's start with you. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I spend um, my days focused on the worst things that are happening to children. Um, but um, in Outlook, I am optimistic because one of the great things about our work is we get to see things that really do work. 
Um, we've seen whether it's um, you know, a dramatic reduction in the use of child soldiers worldwide because of both good new laws and also strong enforcement um, to uh, stigmatization of military use of schools in 105 countries as of last week promising not to do that. We've seen dramatic change in the way California treats young people accused of crimes and we have seen um, some action, for example, on the use of children in the tobacco harvest that's led to a real reduction in the use of child labor and tobacco. But, but right now the decisions are being made that will determine whether um, things get better or worse for children. And it's not just some sort of inevitable thing like the weather, it is intentional decisions made by individuals, whether they're gonna protect children's human rights or violate them. Um, and we don't have to wait for the pandemic to end <laughs> in such as it might end um, for those decisions to be made and be made correctly. So there's several things that we're pushing at Human Rights Watch. Um, the first is, is um, really a policy initiative and that's um, cash transfers to stressed families. Um, it's been just proven to be a key driver of, of historic reductions in child labor. It really supports families that are hit by financial shocks. It really makes a difference. Um, the next, when it comes to child labor, is to support decent employment for adults, including living wage, sick leave, unemployment insurance, protecting the right to freedom of association so unions can mobilize. We've seen, whether we've seen it in the United States and documented in El Salvador and Ecuador, that um, protecting adults' rights to work keeps um, kids from being in dangerous labor situations. Um, but we're also pushing better decisions to be made for education. Um, and we've seen that where parents see returns on education, see quality um, education, they will make real sacrifices. Even, you know, I've talked to kids who in um, the middle of shelling in Mogadishu were still trying to get to school because they so valued education. Um, and that means ensuring that primary and secondary schools are truly free because we've seen that costs and other violations that keep kids out of secondary school push them into labor. Um, ensuring that plans to reopen schools are over-inclusive, that they are doing outreach to the kids who are most likely to not have any education, but also this is a great moment to do outreach to the kids who are already out of school. There's going to have to be a lot of remedial education as schools are reopening. This is a great time to get kids who had already dropped out. We're pushing for barriers that were already keeping school, kids out of schools to be lifted now. You don't have to wait for schools entirely to be open to do things like banning corporal punishment, because we've documented that that makes kids drop out of, drop out of school. Um, there are specific barriers, for example, the Bangladeshi government's absolute bar on formal education for Rohingya refugee children. That, that bar should be lifted now. Um, bans on pregnant girls, like we've seen in Tanzania, promoted by the president himself. Bans on pregnant girls and things that keep young mothers from re-entering school. Those policies can be changed right now. And we can see good practices around protecting schools. For example, the government of Ma the Ministry of Education in Mali, um, once the schools closed down because of COVID, wrote to the Ministry of Defense and said, don't forget we've signed the Safe Schools Declaration. Um, you can't put troops into these closed schools, however attractive that may be. We're pushing to make distance learning um, more accessible. And those are benefits that will go far beyond this immediate crisis. They will benefit children in armed conflict and other crises long time, long, a long time in the future. And finally, we're, we're encouraging donors to use the leverage that they have, whether it's funding quality distance education or using the leverage that they have to push, for example, to barriers to pregnant girls being lifted from schools right now. There's, there's an opportunity to make those changes without waiting. Um, for the pandemic to ease. If donors are funding schools, they can, encourage, um, they can encourage governments to protect those schools by endorsing the Safe Schools Declaration and committing not to use schools um, for military purposes. And I think, you know, overall, I hope this will come out, uh, will come out of this with a much greater appreciation of why um, even what seems like short-term disruptions in children's education should be treated as emergency as an emergency. It's not just, you know, not acceptable for whether they're kids from Syria or Rohingya kids from Bangladesh or kids from Somalia to be told, you know, six months, a year, then we'll get you back in school. This should be treated as an emergency. And I think, you know, every person that has a child who's been sitting at home or struggling to learn should understand that going forward, we need the kind of emergency response to disruption in education that's going to keep kids in school and keep them out of um, exploitative and dangerous labor. So my hope for the future is that we're going to have a lot more opportunities to make that possible. Great, thank you. Um, definitely pragmatic, but also hopeful. That's that's really great.
Um, Anne, what do you think about the future? Well, I describe myself as a pragmatic optimist. I don't think you can be in this work if you're not an optimist, but you can't go in with rose colored glasses, right? You have to be pragmatic. You have to make effort to make that optimism isn't happen. So um, a couple of reasons I'm optimistic. One is, as we said earlier, there's been a lot of um, improvement on child labor in the last 15 to 20 years, right? A net decrease of 94 million kids. So we have learned a lot about what works, right? So we're not restarting from scratch, right? We're, we're, we're starting with all that knowledge, all that base, all those programs, all that experience capacity. So it's not gonna take us as long to build back and we will have to build back, but you know we have a good foundation to build on. So that's the first thing. Second, as Zama already mentioned, um, education is on the top of everyone's mind, right? It's a worldwide issue now with all schools being impacted one way or the other. So um, I think, I know getting and keeping kids in school is gonna be, um, we know it's one of the strongest prevention measures for child labor and all the meetings, all the donor meetings, all the other meetings I go to now, that's what everybody's talking about at education and what are we gonna do? How are we gonna get, how are we gonna help these kids? So it's gonna be a priority. And so good education focus will be a good decrease, a good positive impact on child labor. And on OSEC in particular, as education is all on the top of everybody's mind, so is, no matter where you live, the risks involved in children being online, particularly unsupervised, right? So my experience now over the years is leaders, be it government leaders or company leaders or whatever, are galvanized on an issue when all of a sudden it personally affects them. Right? We've seen that over and over again on social issues that have moved forward. Now we have government leaders stand up and say something when someone in their family gets sick with something or someone in their family is the victim of gun violence or someone in their family is now gay. Right? So it's the same thing with this. Everybody's been impacted on this. So I'm hoping that we can use that increased awareness and sensitivity to uh, galvanize, increase support on the importance of better policies and better programs to equip and navigate and help kids and families equip and navigate uh, their online their, their online safety. And certainly in Child Fund, we are, will be expanding our efforts in this area. It's, we're using a lot of um, the, um, um, the virtual meetings as a way to build capacity in our organization, taking now what's happening in the Philippines, Ecuador, whatever, and sharing it amongst. So we're, we're using this time to build capacity so we can branch out and I'm sure it's going to grow as, a, as an issue for us. And again, I'm hoping it's going to galvanize uh, leaders across the world to support that effort. That's great. That's, that's really good. It's interesting. It does feel like we, we have a shared experience right now that we should all really think about and, and all of these issues seem very um, very solvable in some ways. They're very complex, but like all of you have said, there's very specific things we can do right now. So thank you for that. Lisa, what are, what are you feeling about for the future? Are you optimistic? Sure, sure. I think uh, keep, keeping the theme, we all have to have optimism, right? But it's uh, it's it's hard right now. Um, so I think I think the way I'm thinking about it is that that uh, it's kind of a call to action. I think we, we've, as we've explored in this discussion, you know, the, the ramifications of COVID are far reaching and I think it, it, it will take us many years to kind of make up for, for what ha has come, but it's an opportunity for us to, to shift and, and kind of adapt and strengthen, strengthen things. So um, I, I was reading, a, Save the Children did a similar survey to I think what was referenced earlier on this, um, on this panel, but they, they looked at 37 of their countries and surveyed about 18,000 parents in the communities where they're working. And something that stood out to me was that um, two thirds of the, the parents and caregivers reported that their child had received no contact from the teachers um, since the school closed, right? And all the research shows that for children to really learn, you need this interaction, you need feedback, you need them to this iterative process, right? So, so obviously that's hurting education, but then, but then there's also this concept of the school as a central hub within the community and, and all of the safety nets and the system that sits within these schools and especially in the communities where we're all working. Um, 
you know, the, the school often acts as kind of a community center and, and a place for um, any reports of child, child protection abuses or, or anything like that. And so that's also been removed. So you, I mean, it's easy to feel like it's, it's the perfect storm of just all of these impacts across all the sectors and, and how do we do this? Um, and so I think what's really been on my mind is the inequity of it all. You know, um, here in the US, we're seeing, we're seeing inequities kind of widen because of this. I think it's even more so in the countries where we're working. Um, and, and to put it bluntly, I mean, you need, you need a cushion to absorb the effects of of COVID and the pandemic and the communities and the families with which we're working, they, they have no cushion. They, they were already working on the margins. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. And I think as, as an international development sector, you know, it's, it's a call to action to move forward. Um, I have, during this time through the, through the Seattle Evaluation Association, actually, we've had a lot of discussions about visionary evaluation, which, um, it is this idea of how do you how do you really look at transformation to to reach an equitable and sustainable future? And I think that they make a comparison to um, the the life of a forest and how how you might have birth and trees growing and those trees reach maturity, but but there's often there there needs to be a release of some sort, and whether that be a fire like those of us in the West Coast are experiencing or um, or just, just a tree kind of dying and then rebirth kind of coming from that tree. And, and so what visionary evaluation calls for is for people to think about, um, you know, a project isn't as simple as, as birth to maturity and, and to, to really kind of um, solidify my, my, <laughs> my, my reputation on this panel as the, the data geek, I guess. Um, like I think a lot of monitoring and evaluation research gets stuck in that, that birth to maturity um, phase, right? And, and it's from funders to log frames to, to everything. And, and so this conversation is about, well, how do we actually look at if we want to create transformative change, this, this breakdown, this release, and how we reconfigure and grow from that. And so, so I personally have been trying to think of, well, maybe, maybe the pandemic um, and, and the, the, how that's kind of caused an upheaval to what we, we thought and planned and did, you know, maybe this is the release we need to really, to really make some changes to address equity and sustainability um, moving forward. Thanks, Lisa. That's, that's a good way to think about it. And again, a pragmatic, optimistic way to look about it, look at it too. It is a disruption that provides some, some opportunities. So, um, yeah, and I love that the panelists are so um, consistent in the messages of the link between child labor and education. So um, that's something I, I knew a little bit about, but this is it's it's much more evident now after hearing from all of you. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions from all the attendees now. And again, go to the tab. Um, on, usually it's at the bottom of your screen. That's Q&A and type in your question there. Um, and as you are all thinking and typing, um, I have a question. And um, um, Zema, I think I'm going to have this one for you uh, I, because I know Human Rights Watch uh, advocates and advocates and works directly with governments. And you've all mentioned the power of leadership and the responsibility of leadership to make these changes and to correct some of these uh, horrible trends. Uh, is there an example? of a government or, and it doesn't have to be a national country government, maybe it's a local um, leader, but can you give us an example where it is working, where a leader really is stepping up and making these changes, um, either again at the country level, maybe at an international level, but who is really shining um, in this moment where we need strong leadership? Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put forward um, uh, a golden example of a leader, but I'll give you, um, you know, a couple of example, a couple of things that are that are important. The first is to to mention sort of the ongoing importance of protecting schools in armed conflict. It's not really. It's not exactly a COVID issue, but 
Um, you know, two weeks ago, we celebrated the first international day to protect education from attack. And Niger, the government of Niger followed that with um, leading a Security Council um, discussion of protecting schools in armed conflict. We had the first big Security Council document that referenced the Safe Schools Declaration. I think you see continued momentum to build up strong protections for schools in crisis, whether it's armed conflict or whether it's a pandemic. Um, that um, that that hasn't really lost momentum, even at a moment where um, children are not um, are not in school. I think we're not doing enough to see um, the potential to release release children from detention who shouldn't have been there um, in the first place. But there have been releases from detention. We should see we should see a lot. Um, more. I mean, kids, you know, should never be detained except for the shortest period of time or, or when it's in their own interest. We don't think they should be ever, ever be detained for the purposes of immigration control. Human Rights Watch has been, you know, been on the border, shining a spotlight on abusive conditions, uh, conditions in um, Customs and Border Patrol custody, and in, um, and in, I mentioned. Um, Greece. Um, we've been calling attention to the treatment of um, children, of migrant children in France, and we were glad to finally see that in the context of COVID, where kids who weren't being recognized as children, um, as migrant children, and therefore were sleeping rough or sleeping in squats with adults in the context of COVID, um, they recognized them finally as migrant children in need of protection and, and got them housing. Um, it's not it's not perfect, but I think this is as we mentioned, Lisa mentioned, this is an opportunity to do things better than before, to get kids out of detention who never should have been there in the past, and to really strengthen protections for schools so that they're more resilient in times of crisis. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I have another question, Anne. Anne this is for you. Um, how? How do you work with your partners? If you can talk about that a little bit more. Um, I know that's that's fundamental to your approach, um, but how are you building that trust with your partners in the community um, specific to the programs right now with COVID because there's such a barrier in terms of, of just working virtually right now? Thanks for that, Kristen. Um, we have long-term partnership with our local um, organizations we work with going on sometimes decades. Um, so uh, there's always, there are already a lot of trust built up over the years and there's already been a lot of capacity building. Um, I would say both ways. We learn from them um, what the conditions are locally and they learn from us about new programs and, and uh, uh, technical issues, et cetera. So I think the issue of trust is there um, and um, we work with them like in some ways, like donors work with us at times would they come up with their strategy of what are their issues locally for kids? We often have uh, youth groups as well. I mean, we, we wanna see, to hear your earlier question, children should be seen as leaders on this, right? On their own issue, right? So there's often youth groups that also can impact on the priorities of what the um, local partner will uh, work on in the community. And they come up with their plans and we fund their plans. So we also gave them permission um, to pivot on their programs to respond because we were not able, our staff were not able to move around. They were, they had, you know, smaller geographic areas that they were focusing on. So we knew, we, they knew the issues, we had trust in them, we gave them permission to pivot their programs and their funding in order to respond to needs um, locally. But I just want to add a little bit on that, uh, children as leaders as well. Um, I, I think that's important to think of children having agency that they can impact on things in their lives. And I'll just give you two quick examples. Um, in Uganda, we had children go to um, uh, Parliament, initially met with a few members of Parliament to talk about their issues of what's going on in their schools and violence issues and labor related issues. And it turned out to be a whole day that Parliament then put a whole day devoted to kids issues. And then it turned out to a creation of a children's Parliament. Uh, another example, when I was in Sri Lanka, I saw the culmination of a lot of work where children's leadership groups were formed locally. And they were looking at the issues of schools, uh, the issue of violence in schools and other things that um, are problematic in schools. And the culmination was a, 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 a conference, not a conference, a walk, a, a march first on the capital city um, in a positive way. I use that in a positive way of a walk and children coming together with government officials and putting forward their concerns about school, their um, requests 
put it that way. So I think it's it's important to have our leaders there, but it's often also important to see that children themselves should represent their concerns. So I'll end with that. That's great. That's such a good point. Um, and you know, I, I do find hope when I hear um, young uh, young people, young men and women um, in particular, just speaking at large conferences or at the UN and um, it, it at that level and thinking that I'm sure there are local leaders too all around the world that are community leaders that are younger um, that are that are coming up to give us hope. So thank you for that. Um, Lisa, I have a question for you. Could you um, explain a little more about the talking book technology in terms of of how how it's working um, with uh, local communities, local dialects. Um, how do you adapt in, in that? And um, I think you mentioned this, but can you talk? Were you giving out specific COVID-related information? And if so, how did you? Was it the information that was coming from the government that you were just trying to get to rural areas, or uh, how how did that work? Sure, that's a great question. So, so the talking book um, or, and, and what Amplio offers for products is a platform for organizations to, um, to put their messages and to get those to the hardest to reach communities. So what that looks like often is that uh, an organization will have a project and there's a social behavior change communication component of that project. And so they want to strengthen their impact by, by building out that um, behavior change communication. So they'll often go through a, um, a, a process of articulating their objectives, their impact, and what key messages they want to, to convey to their community members. Um, then, then the creative process kind of comes into play. So often with like a local communication team or um, local celebrities, um, politicians, they'll do the recordings of those scripts with, with um, artistic interpretation of those scripts, I say, because sometimes they, they um, kind of expand past that script. And then that's uploaded into our um, audio content manager. And then that is loaded onto the talking book. And so then these messages are taken out into the community um, and are present in the community. And then they can record new messages and redeploy them onto the talking book when, when they want to kind of update those messages. So for the COVID project, um, the first deployment of messages were pretty uh, aligned very closely to the Ghana Health Services communication points on COVID. Um, and that was in an effort to get messaging out very quickly and in the local language. Um, and sorry, you did ask about the local language. So all the messages can be recorded in the local language. That's why we often work with the local communication organization to, to, put, to record those messages and put them on the talking book. Um, so, so that was the main goal initially. And so Ghana, Ghana Health Services put out kind of their recommendations for, for COVID and we got those onto the talking book. Um, after, after about a month or two, we started recording our, actually I think it was a month, we started recording our second deployment and those were a bit more um, all encompassing. So addressing things like domestic violence or child labor or um, stigmatization. And, and I will say one thing that we found that was really, really critical for the COVID project was that the Ghana team recorded that initial set of messages using religious leaders and political leaders from the local communities. So the COVID project in those eight districts had four different languages programmed. Um, and those local leaders were sitting in those community members communities, they were really well respected. And that helped kind of in this initial, what's going on? What are we supposed to be doing? What is the truth of the situation? Having those local leaders record their messages were really important. And that came out in our usage statistics. So we have um, a dashboard that presents all the different uh, kind of how many times a message was completed or played. And, and by far those endorsement messages and the, from the local leaders were, were the most popular in that first deployment. 
Great. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks for, for sharing more on that. Um, Zama, I have a question for you. Um, early on, Global Washington convened a group of our executive directors and talked about uh, keeping staff safe who are in low and middle income countries. And um, can you share a little bit more? Uh, and I think you have both staff and volunteers that are, are collecting this data. And first, there's obviously an issue of safety in terms of COVID and in terms of, of making sure that they don't contract COVID. The, the people in the field collecting the data, finding out about these abuses. But also on top of that, you're looking at, at some very vulnerable situations and very dangerous situations. So how do you work with um, your partners, your staff, your volunteers, uh, in this situation right now, and, and has it changed because of COVID? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you wonder the thing that keeps me up at night is the security um, of the people we're working with, because people often are risking, some cases risking their lives to share information with us, um, often not with any expectation of benefit for themselves, but with the hope that by sharing their story, um, it will help other people. And, you know, that really gives me a strong feeling that we have a, you know, a moral obligation to use that information to do all that we can in order to stop human rights abuses from um, occurring. Um, security is a, is a big concern. We have, you know, professional security team and a set of procedures for, for all of our staff. We're fortunate that we're able to rely on data collection by professional staff, um, not, not by volunteers, um, but there is rigorous security screening that includes not just the security of the person who's collecting the information, but the security of the people who we interview. And how are we gonna keep that information um, safe, including through digital security, um, so that um, there are no repercussions for the person who shares information with us. I mean, I'll, I'll you know, think back to um, research earlier that I did in Afghanistan, and I ended up with notebooks of information um, from women that, that we couldn't publish because the information that they gave was so identifiable, like they were just were not other witnesses, um, that we even had to withhold um, some publishing some of that information in order to protect them from um, retaliation. In the context of COVID, obviously we we're thinking about we're thinking about our staff, we're thinking about whether we're going to transmit the um, the disease to, to others and how to keep them safe. And that means travel is, is being strictly scrutinized. The good thing is that um, there's a lot more technology available than when I first started in the field. We work really closely. We have deep networks with local partners who we collaborate with. Um, and that allows us to, to really continuing um, continue to access you know a lot of a lot of information just you know think about like how people migrate today different from before you can have the whatsapp contacts um of people and follow up and find out what what happened to them so like in july we put out a report on barriers to secondary education um, for syrian refugees in jordan that report actually followed a report we did several years ago um, where we, we looked at kids who mostly um, were having trouble going to primary school, we were able to actually track down many of those same children and find out what happened to them. And unfortunately, um, very few of them were able to access secondary education, like, like most Syrian refugees in, in, in um, Jordan and, and Lebanon are unable to access secondary education. So I'd say it is a, you know, it is a, a right at the front of my anxiety in the daytime and the nighttime is the security of our staff, but also, um, but especially the people who are taking such risks to share information with us and to make sure we really use it to make change. No, that's that's really good to remember in all of this. And again, the, the data is critical in all of this, but thinking about the, the, the people collecting the data and giving the data is, is, is um, and keeping them safe. Thank you for all of that. Um, we have a qu another question that came in specific, uh, Lisa, for you, um, asking about Amplio and how you work with donors and nonprofit partners to co-design and launch new projects to leverage your talking book technology. Lisa, can you answer that? Sure. Yeah. So we have um, a model where we have con the country office in Ghana and they they um, record and implement programming. And then we have affiliate organizations which are located um, 
in the countries where, where there are talking book programs and they often will assist in kind of the, the programming and um, content development and things for the talking book program. So that currently we have a, a great organization in Kenya called CBCC and they're um, an affiliate and then WizKids in Ethiopia. And so they, we work closely with them so that they can then partner with implementing organizations. Um, and then as a team, we've been doing a lot of thinking about how do we, how do we um, bring this technology to more organizations? So, so often social behavior change communication means bringing in a consultant, doing a lot of expert messaging. Um, and we've been trying to think about how do we, how do we make it more accessible to even like local organizations that recognize the importance of social behavior change communication in their programming. Um, so we've been, been trying to put together self-service tools where an organization can um, take on a talking book project, access our, what we're calling the Ampli of Suite, um, develop their program, their messaging, their, their goals, their targets, and, and then we point them towards um, best practices for social behavior change in that particular topic. And, and that's all meant to encourage them to, to use the talking book to their needs. We really wanna encourage that, um, that messages that are put on the talking book, that, that the way the messages are communicated is locally driven. Um, the, the Kenya team, for example, they, they were working on a project through USAID um, called Afia Tamiza, and, and it was on maternal newborn child health. And I've never listened to such engaging message. And mind you, it, it was in a language I knew nothing. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what the message was about, but they had local singers and actors, and there was a drama that kind of took them through the messages, um, which, which had people coming to the, the women's group like dying to find out what happened in this drama, right? That that also obviously had health and behavior behavior change messages um, embedded in it, and so so all of that's to say, our our goal is to really set organizations up with the tools needed to so that 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 creative process can happen, and and behavior change communication can be embedded within any project because it is such a such a strong component of, of a project kind of across any sector I believe that's great that's great um, so and I have another question for you um, it I also think that there is a worry I've heard there is a a worry that when schools start to open up again that children won't go back because they have settled into something else, whether that be child labor, whether that be taking care of others at home. And I don't know if it's too early, but has Child Fund thought about uh, how to, uh, ways to get children back into school? And, um, you know, maybe thinking about certain countries, if there are schools that are already opening, but I know there's a real danger and real worry that kids are just not going to come back. Yeah. Kristen, we share that concern. We share that concern particularly for girls, that there'd be a, a, a bigger increase in girls not returning than boys. But either one, it's bad news for the kids and bad news for their country. So that's why part of our response now is keeping a connection between the school and the child. We're trying to keep some learning going. Maybe it's not, some places it's probably really high quality learning. Other times, other places it's probably not. But one of the goals is just to keep that connection going so that um, when schools reopen, kids will come back. I do think, though, it's going to take a concerted effort of, of raise, awareness raising and public messaging and campaigns to get kids back into school and to get that enrollment up. And um, I'm, I, I'm optimistic that it can happen, but it's going to take effort to do that. I think that is a real legitimate concern. And I've spoken to some people in the U.S. and and they, you know, it's something that's foreign to us here, to thinking that too many families here, sorry, not to all, that kids wouldn't go back to school or parents wouldn't require their kids to go back to school when the school's open. Um, it's probably a small problem here, but it's going to be a bigger problem elsewhere. 
So I would say that COVID is still ongoing, the pandemic is still ongoing. We have to try to get connections and continue connections, no matter how poor quality they are, but we should always aim for the highest. Keep the connection going. It's, it's easier to keep a connection going than to reestablish one. That's a really good point. Um, and, and Zema or Anne even, are, are you seeing any data coming out yet that children are not going back to school? Again, it might be too early or if it, you know, there's, there's not enough schools open, but are you seeing any data coming back to, to say that children are not going back? I, I did, I'll just say I did see a projection, but nothing real time data. I think it's too early and I think, you know, we are, so I don't want to say at the knife edge, but this is the moment where those decisions that are, are, are being made that are going to make um, a difference. I really liked Anne's point, I would use the term over-inclusive, but, you know, if you have a record of who was enrolled, then you need to be going out and finding out exactly what has happened to every one of those kids and make sure they've come back or figure out why, um, why they haven't. Um, I guess I, you know, maybe it's the perspective of sitting in New York City and having participation in the New York City public um, school system, but I'm worried about the U.S. as much as, you know, we're collecting, we're doing a, a project on um, education and COVID around the world, which includes um, the U.S. and we're hearing stories I mentioned from the um, U.S.-Mexico border, um, but elsewhere where I think we're going to, the, the, the U.S. as well as, as well as countries where people really at least took access to education for granted, that there, there's a risk of rollbacks unless education is, is put back together better than it was before. I, I like to add too that um, I think there'll also be a need for um, a different informal uh, means of education. Um, you know, kids, some kids, some going to be, it is a nightmare to think that some kids might have been able to continue their education in the class and some kids haven't, partly because of the access to inter internet and partly family um, support and help. So I think there's going to be a greater need to look at informal means for kids to catch up and be able to mainstream back into their class, you know, and, and again, when I, uh, when I'm optimistic, there's lots of examples of that. We have a lot of experience in kind of catch up programs for kids. You know, I, I, I remember doing that in the field myself when I was overseas, you know, older kids can catch up quicker and mainstream back into their classroom because then you get the scenario of older kids in younger classes. And you know, that, that often doesn't work very well. It doesn't make the child feel good about going back to school, right? When they're older than their classmates. So I think that the um, inequitable balance that'll turn out will be a challenge that we'll have to figure out. I love that point. And just to add something specific, I and mean, we've been really looking at the right to secondary education, um, which hasn't gotten as much attention as it, admittedly very important efforts to get kids in primary school. But I think with kids now having lost so many years of education, we're going to need to see kids, people who are not, who are no longer children, who need to stay in school to complete their secondary education mm -hmm. and get those qualifications that in this day and age are essential almost everywhere in the world to live a life um, free of of poverty. So really instituting um, protections for people to get secondary education and to make sure secondary education is free. So in places where you're seeing um, an uptick in fees at the secondary level, lifting those fees and getting even people who have missed one, two, three, four years of secondary education, getting them back in school so they can get that degree. That's great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Zama, I'd actually act, like to ask you, because I know you have experience in this, but if others want to uh, jump in, um, Latin America, South America in particular, has been hit hard by COVID, to say the least. And uh, I'm wondering if, Zama, you could talk specifically about South America or Central America. You've talked about migration to the border, but what, tell us, it's, it also seems hard to get information out um, that, that is accurate. So. Can you tell us a little bit um, specifically about South America or Central America as it is, it's impacting children there? It could be about child labor, but or broadly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I'll pick I'll pick one thing because I want to give you something to watch for, and that's our work on um, our work on education in in Latin America. And we'll have stuff coming up, including around the 16 days for activism for the rights of women and girls at the end of the year, looking specifically at what pushes girls out of school in certain countries, including specifically um, access to reproductive rights. That means protection from sexual violence in schools, access to comprehensive sexuality education. Um, 
um, access to abortion and access to quality um, contraception. When we think about how we keep girls, especially in secondary school, longer, which is a part of the real key of, of escaping of like a life of poverty, of, of having more women and girls who are, who are health workers, who are teachers, um, the protection for girls um, uh, uh, rights in school, including freedom from sexual violence and reproductive rights, um, I think will be um, something I hope you'll really watch for. And um, you can look at the Human Rights Watch website, www.hrw.org, and um, get involved with us around the 16 days of activism in the fall. That's great. That's fantastic. I think that starts on November 25th. Is that right? The 16 days. So that's fantastic. Um, and I should point out, I think everyone has noticed, but uh, your chat box that you have here, it is has a ton of information. And um, if people don't know this, you can download the chat onto your own computer. So you can do that before you log out uh, today. It's the, the three little um, dots and you can download it. And uh, we can also consolidate this and send this to you. But each of the organizations has posted more information, links to reports. Um, so uh, such good information. Um, well, we're, we're coming to the end of this conversation. And again, um, the content is is something we should all be aware of. It's disturbing, it's tragic, but the organizations such as yours are doing incredible work and are really um, so needed right now. And again, thinking that uh, this is such a hard time for anyone to think outside kind of their own family, uh, having you all and the people you work with really helping others is something very admirable and it's effective. It's not just um, uh, wishful thinking. It's definitely very effective what you're doing. So I, I wanna recognize that. Um, and it, 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 this fits within Global Washington's larger mission to really raise awareness about the work of global development and also the work of our members. Um, and on that note, um, many of you know that Global Washington has an annual conference. And this year we're going to be doing something a little different. It's obviously going to be virtual. And we're actually doing, we're working with six other cities, seven total, to really look at different issues in global development as they relate to the sustainable development goals. So we're actually looking at all 17 sustainable development goals across seven cities before our annual conference. So this will all roll up into an annual, what we're calling a national forum virtually on December 7th and 8th. So we would love for all of you to participate and be involved. Um, there's more information. We're calling this our goal makers initiative. Um, so there's more information on our website at Global Washington, or um, you can even just type in www.goalmakers.org and it'll get you there. So the issues such as child labor as education, and as we've all been talking, you know the 17 sustainable development goals, they're specific to topics, but what Global Washington wants to do is look at these cross-cutting issues. You can't just solve child labor, as we've said here today, without look addressing education. So at our national forum on December 7th, we'll be looking at all these cross-cutting issues and how we can all get back on track with the sustainable de development goals given COVID and how we can do this in a more equitable manner, as we've all been talking about. This is a moment, a disruption. Um, I like Lisa's analogy of thinking about a forest. You can't just think about the beginning and end you think about everything that happens in between and think about those opportunities to, to do global development differently. So I hope you can all enjoy, join us then. So thank you so much to our speakers today. Um, and thank you again for the work you're doing. Um, and it is good to be a, a pragmatic optimist in these times. So thank you again. Thank you everyone who's attended. Um, and we'll get back to you with uh, these resources and please follow up with these organizations to learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.